Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. Today, our guest is Sarah Milne. Sarah and I actually first met at Burning Man a couple of years ago. And although we didn't talk too much about work, after I showed her my portfolio, she shared with me the work that she was doing, and I was blown away. Sarah works for an organization called As You So, which uses something called shareholder advocacy to move corporations to be more responsible. As You So is responsible for some pretty phenomenal wins like getting Target to phase out polystyrene foam, getting banks like Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley to pull out of funding the Dakota Access Pipeline, convincing Disney to not show images of smoking in its youth rated films, and that's just a small list of all the stuff that they've managed to do. Now, how do they do it? Well, that's the reason I wanted to invite her onto this show, to give you guys, the listeners, a little peek into the work that she's done and how they apply pressure to make change happen. If you're a shareholder in a large company, this just might be a way that you can put those shares to good use. Anyways, this is Sarah Milne, and here she is answering my question on how they get conversations started with these big corporations in the first place. It's really interesting with public facing consumer focused corporations like Wendy's and KFC. It's a completely different conversation than with Chevron and Exxon and Duke Energy. Completely different because a lot of what we're doing with our conversations in the big oil companies is socializing ideas that otherwise might not make it into general circulation. So are you familiar with the concept of stranded asset risk or carbon asset risk? No, no, please, please uh, explain it. Damn. Okay, I was going to say... As you so played a material role in socializing that concept, I had thought we had helped get it over into mainstream, but apparently not quite as much as I want. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, what, 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 are, what are the two terms? Tell me. Stranded asset risk and carbon asset risk. There are two different words for the exact same idea. Climate change. We know how much carbon can go into the atmosphere and still keep global warming to 1.5 degrees C or less since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, okay? We know that number. We also know the amount of carbon that is in proven fossil fuel reserves. So the oil and gas and coal that's in the ground that has not been produced, burnt, sold, that kind of stuff, we know how much carbon is in there. If we're going to stay below two degrees C, we have to keep 80% of what we already know, what we've already discovered has to stay in the ground. Okay. Say you're an oil company. The value of your company is almost entirely your reserves. Those reserves cannot come out of the ground if we're going to stay at two degrees or less. That asset has to be stranded. So let's say I've got 10 barrels of oil in the ground and therefore my company is worth $100. Yeah, sorry, no. Eight of those barrels have to stay in the ground unless you know we turn total planet side. 80% of what I call an asset, I can never turn into money. So that asset is stranded. And what are you telling these companies? So now these companies have a new term to describe something they absolutely don't want to happen. And then what? They can't. Yes. So back <laughs> in, I think it was 2011, As You So's secured a commitment from ExxonMobil to publish a report about their exposure to stranded asset risk. This is an absolutely legitimate question for an investor to ask. I'm an Exxon shareholder. Are you guys, is my investment exposed to stranded asset risk? What is the risk? And Exxon published in 2011, I think it was, the oil industry's first public report explicitly addressing stranded asset risk. In that report, Exxon said, eh, we don't have any risk at all. We are 100% confident that we can produce and sell every last barrel of oil that we have discovered to date and everything we're gonna discover in the future. So Exxon went on public record basically saying, 
Yeah, we're going to keep exploring and we're going to keep producing and selling the fossil fuels we discover in the future. And we know that we can do that because we don't think that the world's governments are going to take action on climate change. And interestingly, so far, ExxonMobil is correct. Nobody is preventing the fossil fuels from coming out of the ground. So if we are to keep global warming to two degrees C or less, then 80% has to stay. It's a risk, but it's a risk only if the world takes action on climate change. Wow, that's just crazy. Like on one hand, you go, I can't believe that these guys are so blind that they would completely ignore climate change. And then on the other hand, you're like, well, of course, because the purpose of the company is to maximize shareholder value. And it's just completely screws with your mind. But anyways, I want to get back on track here. Um, so beyond socializing concepts, as you so seems to have a very complicated relationship with companies, do these companies generally like you or hate you? Because it's sort of like on one hand, you're protecting them because you're raising the flag and saying, hey guys, there's something to worry about here. Um, and then on the other, you're causing them a lot of headache in the present. So what is that like? It depends. We work very hard to create and maintain a mutually respectful working relationship with the companies and with the people that we talk with at the companies. And there are a number of companies that we engage with every single year ongoing. The relationship varies to a certain extent depending on the industry. We have a very different relationship with Wendy's and KFC than we do with Duke Energy or Southern Company or even with Exxon and Chevron. There are a number of times that a company has taken a step and explicitly credited, as you so, for encouraging them to take that step. There are a number of times where a company or individuals inside the company come to us and don't make a public acknowledgement of gratitude, but say quietly to us, I've been trying to get the company to go in this direction for a couple of years, and thank you so much. Your engagement has amplified it to the point where now we're actually doing it. So one of the very interesting things is we are investors. We are shareholders. We are talking to them on the same side. And really, we bend over backwards to make the relationship mutually supportive. On the other hand, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce would like to squash shareholder resolutions altogether. So that's one way that shareholder engagement makes a difference. There are a number of companies and a whole ecosystem at corporate levels that would like to squash, just make the shareholders go away. Okay, so let's backtrack here for a second, just to get the listeners up to speed. Can you walk us through how publicly traded companies actually work and what exactly this shareholder resolution strategy is in order to bring about change in the world of as you so? Public corporations are regulated by the SEC, and the SEC has a shareholder resolution regulation. If a shareholder resolution meets the regulations, that the company has to print it on their proxy statement and send it to every shareholder. Companies don't want to do that. It just junks up their proxy statement. So that exactly right there is how we get in the door. That's why C-suite level management talks to us. And, and so can anyone file a shareholder resolution? Like, why are you guys uniquely in a position to do that? The SEC says that any shareholder that has held $2,000 worth of stock for a calendar year has the right to file a shareholder resolution. So yes, the bar is pretty low. If you are passionate and if there's an appropriate company, you certainly can. The requirements for what is admissible or permissible in a shareholder resolution are very rigid. And just because I file a shareholder resolution doesn't mean it automatically will go on the company's proxy statement. The company can challenge the resolution at the SEC. The SEC has a ton of reasons for saying, yeah, company, you're right. You don't have to pay attention to this. Micromanagement, ordinary business. So a shareholder resolution can't address the company's ordinary business. 
there's a very narrow window of what will pass SEC scrutiny in a resolution. So as you so has been doing this work for 27 years, we really know our stuff. So we write resolutions that both will contribute to compelling change and have a very high likelihood of passing SEC scrutiny. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know, every time I talk to somebody about regulations and rules and government, it always seems like everything takes forever. So at the end of the day, all these changes end up being these like tiny, tiny little incremental points of progress in order for change to ever take place. Is that the same in your world? It is almost always a game of increments, right? but we will take the increments. And the argument that we're making to corporations is either this is a risk that is coming at you that you may not have noticed, which we do with a lot of companies, or it may be this is a potential benefit that you're not seeing. Um, so antibiotics, you understand that a lot of the reason that the antibiotics are less and less effective is because of the way they're used in factory farms. So we have a whole initiative pushing on poultry producers and beef and pork producers to quit using antibiotics useful to human medicine as a prophylactic. We had in three years, we changed the entire poultry industry in the United States. And we did it by talking to McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, and KFC, and saying there are a lot of moms and families out there who are getting increasingly freaked out about antibiotics in the chicken McNuggets and the chicken burgers that our children are eating. And we pointed out to management at the fast food restaurants a real risk of a tsunami of consumer outrage. After two years, I think, of engagement with As You So, all four of them turned to their supplier chains and said, hey, we're not going to buy chicken raised with medically important antibiotics anymore. And the three largest poultry producers in the United States, without any direct pressure from us, they said, okay, we're going to stop using antibiotics because if Kentucky Fried Chicken, if KFC won't buy my product, I got to change. So we changed. If we had gone straight to the poultry producers, we would have gotten nowhere because we didn't have a lever of pressure. With Wendy's and KFC, we did. It was your customers are going to turn their back on you and start screaming really loud. So <laughs> that's a great story. Um, always great when the good guys win. I mean, I think we would probably be better off without them altogether. Um, but in the meantime, I guess this is definitely one of those really great incremental steps forward to protect people to the best of our abilities for now. Do you guys have any other strategies at as you so in your shareholder resolution kind of toolkit in order to bring about change? So a lot of our resolutions are asking for a report. Let's see, one of our more recent initiatives is addressing workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion, workplace DEI. And we did a whole series of resolutions this year that asked a variety of companies to publicly report on things like their promotion, recruitment, and retention data. There are a lot of companies saying, oh, we've got this great DEI program and it's doing really good things. There's no comparable data across sectors and industries to do any kind of comparison and to figure out what really works. So this is a new initiative for us. And our first year in the initiative, we are seeking data that's comparable. Once we get the data, we will tend to write a report a scorecard that analyzes all of the key performance indicators that we've gotten information on, including does not disclose or does not report. And then we'll publish a scorecard where we rank all of the corporations that we've reached out to. And then the next year, we'll go back to a shorter list of companies that we've strategically selected where we think they're leaders for one reason or another. And if they take action, their peer companies will have to follow or lose competitive advantage. We'll go back to them the next year and say, hey guys, 
you were ranked number 14. Are you okay with this? Do you want to be number 14 and let your peer com- competitors be number three and number two? Here's what you need to do, blah, 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 blah. And we'll start a conversation like that. And then the following year, we will publish an updated scorecard with updated rankings and get a race to the top billing. So that's one thing that we do with our resolutions is ask for reports to get numbers that we can then start moving other companies toward a goal. Oh, that's a super great strategy. It it actually reminds me of this conversation I had with John Hosevar in episode 13 from Greenpeace. And they had done kind of a similar strategy of scoring people based on their sustainable fishing practices. And of course, no company wants to be last. And just by doing the report and scoring people automatically puts tremendous pressure to not be last. And so I think there's something really wise about that process. Yes, exactly. And then the reports and the scorecards also, when we go into a corporate engagement or a dialogue, we have evidence and we are asking for actions that are based on data and evidence, which makes it much easier for management to listen. Yeah, I love it. Is there a way for individuals who own shares in publicly held companies to authorize their shares for certain initiatives? Do these sort of directories totally. exist where you can? Yeah. No, you come, you, you just come to as you so. So we go on your That's... website and then what happens? You send an email to info at asyouso.org and say, I am interested in participating. Now, likely it's not going to be direct because if you own shares personally, likely you're working with a financial advisor. So the easiest way to do that, talk to your financial advisor and have your financial advisor reach out to us. Most people that are invested in the stock market these days are invested through mutual funds, not through direct stock ownership. So a resolution has to be direct stock ownership. If it's a mutual fund, there's an intermediary and that doesn't work. And we've got a whole complete other mutual fund element to our work called know what you own or invest your values. Yeah, I was just going to ask you to expand upon that because I think one of the things that many people don't realize is that the money that they own is often funding things that they're not ethically aligned with. So walk me through the the tools that you guys have developed to help people be just simply more aware of what their own money is doing. Exactly. It's a whole set of tools. We've got seven separate sites now that we call invest your values or how to align your investments with your values. Mutual funds are baskets of stocks, hundreds and hundreds of different companies. And there is nothing that regulates the name of the mutual fund. So Vanguard could have a mutual fund that says fossil free and could have it full of Exxons and Chevrons and Halliburton and Schoenberg's, et cetera. Fossilfreefunds.org is a website that we built and maintain that screens 3,000 of the most commonly held mutual funds in the United States for fossil fuel companies. And it will just tell you exactly what percentage are in coal, what percentage of that mutual funds holdings are direct in oil companies, in oil field services, you can pick the level. And then if you scroll down a little bit, we literally grade A, B, C, D, F. We now have seven screens fossil fuels, deforestation, weapons of mass destruction, guns, gender equality, tobacco, and our newest is prison free funds. And each of those is a separate site. So if you have a particular interest in weapons, you can go to the weapons site. But partway down the homepage on all seven is a sustainability report card that grades that fund on all seven of our screens. Yeah, I actually just used it and uh, took a screenshot of one of the funds that I know that my financial advisor put in and I just sent it and there's a ton of F's and D's and C's. (laughs) It's quite disappointing uh, considering it's supposed to be a sustainability fund. Why would it have an F in deforestation? There you go, because they didn't do the research and it is not a simple task to do this research. It is, it didn't exist before we did it and nobody else is doing this anywhere. It so aligns with our vision of what the world needs to be, we had to do this. 
all of the sites also do a financial returns comparison, one year, three year, five year, 10 year. So we're not just presenting you with information about what the holdings are. We're presenting you with the financial returns. And interestingly, by and large, the funds that earn higher grades on the ESG screens also tend to earn higher returns. It's like uh, giving a score to abstract notions like resiliency and sustainability and actually now being able to synthesize what that might look like on a scorecard. So I think it's super cool. And I was actually really pleasantly surprised at how fast and intuitive and simple it was and beautiful because you go to most of these other index funds and you look through their brochures and it's archaic. It's like made in like the 1980s. It's like, what is this garbage? So this was a totally pleasant experience. Our internal belief is that the financial industry intentionally makes things obscure and hard to understand because that keeps them in control and in charge and prevents the great unwashed masses like us from having knowledge and power. That is why we created these websites and these mutual fund screens, it's like trying to get rid of the intermediary, a little bit like Martin Luther saying, wait a second, people can talk straight to God. We don't have to go through you, Mr. Catholic priest. We're trying to do something similar, make it totally accessible and intuitive. And the easier it is to grasp, the more people will take action. Absolutely. And our goal is to move the entirety of our nation's capital out of the stuff that is creating the world that we don't want and into companies that are creating the clean energy future that we do want. Safe, just, and sustainable. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I wanted to throw you a little bit of a curveball here because two episodes ago, I had an impact investor come on called Charlie Kleisner. And one of the problems that he had with ESGs was that even if the entire world followed these ESG guidelines, the world would still be totally in trouble. And that basically ESGs were just this massive form of greenwashing because ultimately ESGs just means that a company is well run, right? If you have a more diverse group of people running the company, it'll make better decisions. If you use resources wisely, then you'll save more money. And so his contention was that ESG work is completely useless. And I'm super curious to know because you guys use ESG as this critical tool to change behaviors, what your perspective was on the issue. I agree with your previous guest to the extent that there's a now a whole arena called corporate social responsibility, CSR, and there are CSR managers and a lot of companies are writing CSR reports every year. And a lot of that is greenwashing. A lot of it is words, not action. And I totally agree that if every corporation did everything that they're publishing in their CSR reports, we wouldn't be anywhere close to meeting the Paris Accord. But it is still a super useful idea. The word ESG is just shorthand title for paying attention to the environmental and social consequences of this action that you're going to take. So let's say you've got a business decision coming up. The first thing that you think about is, will it cost money or will it be profitable? ESG just says, hey, you need to also look at the environmental consequences of that business decision and the social consequences and the governance consequences if there are any. It says you can't just look at profit. You have to look at these other things. So I see no downside at all in encouraging corporations to consider environmental and social elements at the same time as they're looking at the numbers. The business roundtable last August agreed when they came out with their statement that the purpose of a corporation can no longer be shareholder primacy the purpose of a corporation must envelop and encompass all stakeholders, which was a huge reverse. And interestingly, everyone on the, in the business roundtable signed their names, like Jamie Dimon put his name to that, which is interesting because that is an excellent example of a lot of our actions aren't meeting, aren't matching our words. Words are a place to start. 
you don't get action without the words coming first. Actually, we've done a number of resolutions with companies that signed the stakeholder capitalism announcement or proclamation from the Business Roundtable. We've taken them to task in resolutions and saying, so what actually are you doing besides just saying that you're part of this? Very good. It's super good that you're coming by and holding people accountable. I guess another philosophical question, one step further, you've been fighting this issue for six six or so years in As You So. Do you think that capitalism and humanity can coexist? Are we doing enough fast enough or is this not quite enough? So this response has to be entirely personal to me. I'm not As You So and not reflecting As You So's beliefs. I think capitalism is extraordinarily powerful. And I think capitalism is a good thing if with a major, huge, vast, if it is properly regulated by government. If we had adequate government oversight and regulation, I don't think we would need shareholder engagement. I think the things that shareholders push for are things that are more properly and more effectively, frankly, achieved through government regulation. I think that Milton Friedman and the pivot to shareholder capitalism ruined capitalism. I think that stakeholder capitalism is brilliant, but only if it truly and legitimately puts stakeholder interests on a par with shareholder interests so that stock price and annual profits absolutely are not in charge. Profits, environmental, community, social, if everything is given equal weight, I think capitalism is by far the best economic system, but if properly regulated by government, and that's where we fall down. That's where we just have totally thrown every baby out with the bathwater and created the capitalism that we've seen in this country in the last 40, 50 years is horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Let's stick on this personal track for a little bit because you have reinvented yourself many times over the years. And I think one of the really interesting things is that you started off your professional life working for Chevron. But to be fair, this was before a lot of this climate change science was even far out in the public awareness. So how did you go from working for a company like Chevron to now being so actively engaged in the environmental space? Are you trying to make amends for the past or what what happened? Oh, interesting. I hadn't ever couched it in terms of making amends for the past. And no, I don't feel that I personally need to make amends. When I was at Chevron, it was in the early 80s, 1982, 83, 84, thereabouts. And I absolutely loved it. At the And that was before, I think that our first public awareness of climate change was 1986. And I was not at Chevron anymore. But What Chevron was doing was powering the world. And I absolutely loved it. And frankly, Chevron is an incredibly well-managed company. There were a number of reasons I left Chevron and moved to Ampex. And then when my son was born, it was more of a... So working in the for-profit world was really fascinating, intellectually challenging, remunerative, fun. I felt like an absolute grown-up. But when my son was born, I absolutely could not imagine leaving him as an infant and a newborn to go back to making money for a large organization. So I chose to stay home. It originally was going to be three months and then it was six months. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do this for three years. And then my daughter was born and a number of things happened. And I ended up staying home for 16 years and it was raising my children. It was contributing to my community and it was taking care of my parents on their end of life journey. And when those pressures alleviated sufficiently for me to look at going back to work. The first thing I looked at is going back to the corporate kinds of work that I had done before and that I had invested so much of my time and emotion and capacity in. And it was really interesting. It just left me cold. 
And it was almost a physical sensation in my heart of coldness. And I said, okay, it took me a long time to talk myself out of that investment that I'd had in in that world. And I looked around and I said, what does interest me? And it turned out to be environmental things and conservation and land use and oceans and environmental health. But where did that love come from? Where did that love for the environment come from? Absolutely no idea. But I spent six months paying attention to, for instance, what articles I would choose to read in the newspaper and what took my interest. When I decided not to go back into corporate, the entire world was open. What, where, what direction do I go? And it turned out when I started writing down what kinds of articles I was reading through to the end, they were all environmental or conservation. No idea where that came from at all, but that was my evidence for what direction to go. I knew nothing about it, so I decided that I should go back to school. And let me tell you, going back to school at age 50-ish with a whole bunch of 23-year-olds is a very interesting activity. (laughs) I was older than the professors, but it was fascinating. And that was in 2009. And I am absolutely horrified to admit that 2009 is when I heard about climate change for the first time. And I had been struggling with what should I do? Should I go into brown environmentalism, like making the electrical things better and cement plants? Or should I go into green stuff, which is the positive side? And as the concepts around climate change sunk in more and more, I more and more, it was obvious to me that if we don't get climate change, literally nothing else happens. All the social programs don't matter. All of the land conservation easements and the marine protected areas literally don't matter if we don't get climate change. And so that's how I focused in on climate change is going to be my direction and what I care about and where I want to contribute. I, I love this strategy of looking at the articles you were reading like for six for a six month period to figure out which direction to go. I think there's so many people in the world that wish they could do more good, but don't really know how or which direction to go or feel like they're too far along in life to pivot. What do you have to say to to that? Or what pieces of advice do you have that your journey has taught you that may help someone find their own sort of calling yeah. in something with more meaning and purpose? One thing that I'd say is I was looking back, I was actually lucky that I had the period of unemployment, also known as full-time stay-at-home mom, that I had. I don't know that I would have been capable of making the pivot that I did if it involved walking away from a six-figure salary. But I had been unsalaried for 16 years. So I was going to have to start over at some level And it was immensely difficult to walk away from what I'd done before, even though I had that 16 year hiatus. If I was still working, I don't know that I could have made that pivot. So not sure if that's helpful to anybody. If you're already totally screwed, hmm, makes it easier to change. (laughs) (laughs) That's one way to look at it. But you could have just gone and just taken any job. But you actually put your foot down and said, no, I want this next portion of my life to be true to my values. And you did take a certain amount of agency and went back to school with all these 20 some years old. That took an enormous amount of agency. And I know exactly where that came from. Raising my children and burying my parents matters. Selling toilet paper does not matter. Yes, selling toilet paper matters, but not in the way that raising children and burying parents is life and death. I had to be I had to spend my days and my hours doing something that was as important as raising my children and burying my parents. Wow. Wow. That's such a powerful way to look at it. I've heard this a couple of times being thrown around and people say, oh, we need more feminine energy in the world. But like, what is feminine energy? And and like hearing this is to me, I'm interpreting this as women see life in circles and men see life in like lines. Women, when they, because they raise children, they see the circularity. And so they think about the future in the design of what they they do. And, and what I'm hearing in, in this answer is this really beautiful concept of circularity embedded in the lifestyle and the path that you choose. Interesting. I had not 
thought of it in those terms. And I'm going to let that process because I think there's something really powerful there. And it reminds me of something that I did um, towards the, so I did the one year of school and then I had to job hunt and it took six months, seven months, real job hunt pain. But while I was going through that process, everybody that I met, and I was reaching out to everybody and anybody, everybody I met, I always said, what was your path? How did you get to where you are from where you started? And what fascinated me was that every single answer was a variation of I started with A and then I went to triangle and then there was purple and then there were squiggles <laughs> and I ended up at C. Not a single person was A, B, C, D, E, F. They may have ended at F, but there were triangles and iridescent sparkles and rabbits along the way. So it was, I didn't think of it as circle, but it was definitely crisscrossing. Kind of right. Yeah. Crossing and way outside. There was one gentleman that I talked to who started out as a yoga teacher and currently is the head of public relations for the California Air Resources Board. That's just a wow. The other thing I'd say is that it's never too late to make a change. If you feel trapped, it's likely because of assumptions that you're making that you haven't surfaced. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I, I recently installed a, a tab on my Google browser and it tells me the number of days left I have to die based on like statistics. Oh my God. <laughs> you do that? Did you find that? I love it. Obviously, you put, you love it. If that would terrify me, that would, I think that would, that would paralyze me. Well, here, here's the thing though. It's a long time. So I have 19,120 days left. And even if you remove 10,000 of that, I'd still have 10,000 days. And so when you think that it only takes you 10,000 hours to become an expert at something, um, I've been like really rethinking time and how yeah. much time I still have to become whoever I want to be. And yes, there's mortality, but there's value in that mortality. The tab name is mortality, by the way. Mortality. <laughs> I like that. I'm, I thank you. I think I will add I'll send to it. it. To you. I, yes, please do. And then I will forward you one of my favorite couplets from one of my favorite poems from Mary Oliver. What is it that you're going to do with this one wild and precious life? Yeah, I, I love that quote. It's so beautiful. And I think that is going to be the perfect segue for us to move into the final question for you. And that is, if you had a megaphone to the world, Sarah, what would you ask everyone to do? Just right there, vote and go bring 10 friends with you to vote. Voting matters. And yeah, four years ago, I would have said something related to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, but really climate change, we are not going to fix climate change without government action. And the appropriate government action is only going to come if we vote the right people in. Alrighty, there you have it, folks. That was Sarah Milne. That's M-I-L-N-E from As You So. Dot org. Make sure to go to their website, check it out, look at their report cards, because I think that was probably the most interesting, actionable thing that I stumbled upon in terms of double checking where my money was sitting, even if it had the words sustainability attached to it. And of course, if you're in America, well, make sure to vote because it's an important one, uh, definitely for the environment. If you like this episode, make sure to check us out at impacteverywhere.org. There is a whole bunch of shareable sound bites, graphics, as well as a YouTube video in case some of your friends don't listen to podcasts, but you think they should listen to this one. There's a solution there just waiting for you. Next week, we have someone quite interesting that I've been trying to get on for a little while. His name is Brandon Harvey, and he runs a newspaper, a physical newspaper called Good 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 that focuses, you guessed it, on good news. And it's a really inspirational episode with lots of great anecdotes. I hope you managed to tune in. I can't wait to see you guys around and stay positive folks because impact is everywhere.